Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is our third educational session and we continue to have a great amount of interest and in attendees at these events. And so we really wanna thank you for taking the time to join us. We've got great guest speakers today from Cleveland Heights and uh, really the, the goal of these is to provide some educational information and also case studies where things have worked well. And um, we do have recordings that you should have had uh, links to those in the email that went out about this on the previous two sessions. And we just wanna really thank uh, GCRTA, the city of Shaker Heights, City of Fairview Park and the City of Cleveland for their uh, assistance as we work through this and in their partnership. So um, it's going to be a great, another great session. And I just want to thank Patrick and our whole team who've been leading this effort. And um, we're really excited about the, the work to come in the future. So I, with that, I will turn it over to you, Patrick. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mary. Just a couple quick housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, please remain muted. We will be saving some time at the end of today's session for Q&A. Uh, at that point, we're asking that you use the reaction button uh, to click raise hands and we'll call on you uh, to ask questions or to share your thoughts. We have a number of folks who have been uh, in support of this effort uh, from the Cuyahoga County Planning Commission, a uh, great number of staff there, as well as our partners at the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, thanks to Mary, Beth, and Mandy, as well as Joey, who are on the call. From the City of Cleveland, Shaker Heights, and Fairview Park, a number of fantastic partners there as well. Uh, we have a few people who are uh, new to this. We extended the invite to um, some additional folks this time. So as a bit of background, we are talking about transit-oriented development, and we are using the FTA transit-oriented development definition, which says TOD includes a mix of commercial, residential, office, and entertainment centered around or located near a transit station. Dense, walkable, mixed-use development near transit attracts people and adds to vibrant, connected communities. We know transit-oriented development here in our region. This is an example at Lorraine and 25th in Ohio City, the intro project, which showcases a number of important features like a proximity to transit, a mix of uses, and appropriate density. It's close to the street, and it has limited parking, in this case, underneath. Uh, our goal for this project is to improve zoning regulations and governmental policies in order to attract more TOD like this to key corridors in Cuyahoga County. What we found is that we're looking for corridor-wide land use strategies, coordinated zoning, and an incentive strategy. The project that we've outlined includes four tasks. Uh, the state of TOD in Cuyahoga County, where we're talking about the importance and describing TOD generally. We're heading into the analysis of TOD zoning, where we're looking at zoning along transit lines to help understand whether or not it allows TOD in the future. And then we'll be heading into model TOD zoning and TOD financing strategies. For more updates on the project, you can go to countyplanning.us slash TOD, where our first state of TOD report is uploaded. And for an interactive overview of that first report, you can go to countyplanning.us slash TOD overview. Uh, we've been having these conversations to talk more about TOD across the county and from other regions in the Great Lakes, Fridays from 12 to 1 via Zoom. Um, if you were not able to join us for fantastic conversations with Shaker Heights in Minneapolis, those video recordings are available online. Please just email me and I'd be able to send that if you don't have that link. Thanks to Joyce, Dan, Luke, and Mike for presenting at those two. Today we have uh, some other local speakers, Eric Zampt and Karen Knittel from the city of Cleveland Heights. We're very thankful that they've offered to give some time uh, to talk through Cleveland Heights, as well as some examples from New York. And our final TOD session of the year is on 1216 at 12 p.m. with the city of Indianapolis, uh, Shannon Norman, a principal planner there. If you have not received the invite, please email me at phewitt at cuyahogacounty.us. And with that, I will turn it over to Eric and Karen for their presentation. Thank you so much again. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm just getting the presentation going here. And hopefully everybody can see that. We can. So I uh, just wanted to thank everyone and introduce ourselves a little bit more. Um, first off, I'm Eric Zampt. I'm the Director of Planning and Development for the City of Cleveland Heights and uh, a newcomer to Cleveland Heights and Northeast Ohio, having moved here from New York in uh, January of 2021. So that's part of uh, the uniqueness, perhaps, of today's presentation. And Karen, if you wanted to introduce yourself. Sure, and I'm Karen Knittel. I'm the Assistant Planning Director, and I've been with Cleveland Heights now for over 20 years uh, in the planning department. So I have kind of a long-term uh, 
perspective uh, while Eric gets to bring in the newcomer review of what we've been doing and where we should go. And we're really excited to uh, to be a part of this uh, speaker session and, and very thankful to Patrick, Mary, and, and the county and Mary Beth from GC, GCRTA and, and all the project partners for really leading this effort because we think it's so, so important. Uh, and what we wanted to do today is uh, speak to you about two different buckets. One is that actually TOD can happen in a place without a train station or even without a bus station. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about how that's happened in Cleveland Heights. And then some of my experiences working in New York uh, metro area and some of the things that uh, they're doing over there that may inform uh, this project and our efforts going forward. I always like to start off a presentation with some inspiration and Jane Jacobs is usually my go-to and I think she said it so well here that you can't rely on bringing people downtown unless you put them there in the first place. And that's really a, such an important aspect of uh, transit-oriented development, even within the suburbs, because having the people there allows for that activity, allows for the use of that uh, transit facility, whatever it may be, and really just makes our places more sustainable and resilient. So the premise that we wanted to talk a little bit about with regards to Cleveland Heights is number one, it does, TOD doesn't always have to happen around a train or a bus station. Um, and so even though we've heard some really great things from Joyce and Shaker about the Van Aken district, and then uh, Michael from Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago, this is gonna be probably a bit more applicable to uh, most of you who are watching and listening today. And then I think Indianapolis will be also similar going forward. Uh, You'll see here just two pictures in our community. One is at the intersection uh, of North Taylor and uh, Grayton Nellevue. It's close to East Cleveland. It's the Route 77A, and it's got a, a, a bus shelter. Uh, it's, a, it's a little node, a little commercial node, uh, but it's, it's probably there because there's a, some transit access. Below that, we have uh, the, the bus stop at Maple and Mayfield, which is a very different typology. Uh, it's residential on a very busy corridor. And so that may not be a place where the typical or the traditional transit-oriented development uh, concept would make sense. But regardless of the location, um, we think that having the government, the municipality, the, uh, the city uh, be involved uh, is so important and that has to be proactive. Uh, I think that this intersection of Cedar and South Taylor is so telling and it's, it's something that was actually introduced by the county in one of their earlier presentations and uh, should be a topic of discussion going forward. But here we have uh, a place where half of the street, the right side of the street on the, on the uh, picture is Cleveland Heights, the left side is University Heights and two very different environments. But it's a place that's so important because uh, the the nine runs down Cedar coming out from the city and, but, and out to, to South Euclid um, and beyond. And it's a place where a lot of Case Western students um, live because housing is more affordable. And so we have this tremendous opportunity here, but yet the intersection is not united in any way. And even though our zoning codes um, are somewhat similar, they're both local retail districts, the regulations are very different. And so it'll be so important as we talk further about making sure that that regional or multi-jurisdictional coordination is happening. And we're having some great conversations with University Heights and South Euclid about sort of active transportation and streetscape because the average person doesn't know where that property or that the municipal border is. So I'll throw it over to Karen to walk you through some of the things that we've done, the city has done over the really the past 20 years that um, were it, it, frankly uh, pretty progressive and forward thinking and hopefully uh, things that we can build on and, and things that can be informative to you. Okay, so um, what you're seeing here is a slide from our 2004 zoning amendment that created the C2X zoning district. And uh, this district was established to provide standards for the continued operation of mixed use neighborhoods and to provide for dense mixed uses along main thoroughfares and to concentrate 
mixed use buildings to promote and encourage pedestrian activity. Parking and driveways are generally located so as not to disrupt the pedestrian activity. And as I think most of you know, in Cleveland Heights, our commercial districts are nestled into our residential neighborhoods. And so uh, the C2X height regulations acknowledges this by um, regulating height and setbacks um, permitted based upon what uses and zonings are adjacent to the C2X district. So that's what you can see in this um, graphic on, on this slide. All right, do you wanna go ahead to the next slide? So in 2012, uh, Cleveland Heights adopted sustainable zoning code amendments, and these updates uh, to the code were created mainly to address sustainability objectives, the economic, social, and, and commercial concerns of sustainability. But many of these 2012 amendments encourage density, reduce the amount of pavement uh, dedicated to parking, and address pedestrian-friendly design. And these are all values that can contribute to transit-oriented design principles. So in our commercial district in the 2012 sustainable amendments, uh, the code addressed many things um, as part of the physical form. The code requires that 60% of, of our commercial street lineage buildings have windows and it requires that there be pedestrian orientation uh, and, and that is encouraged by requiring that there be public entrances along the primary streets as well as um, from parking areas that may be behind the building. The 2012 updates, the parking standards have multiple subcategories. You can see some of them listed here. Parking minimums were reviewed and updated and um, parking maximums were established for, for the various uses in our commercial districts. Uh, Multifamily and non-residential mixed use build, buildings cannot exceed 120% uh, um, of the minimum required um, parking. Parking flexibility is encouraged through shared parking. Um, our regulation is now organized around a chart that considers uses and types of uses uh, and to encourage the shared use in parking lots. It also, the code also permits land banking for future parking needs, uh, meaning that areas that are not currently needed for parking should remain green space. And only after it's been demonstrated that additional parking is required should we re consider removing that land bank designation. Car share facilities were defined um, as a membership-based car sharing service, and, uh, and that helps so that we do not have to look at them as a motor vehicle rental use. Uh, spaces within a parking uh, lot or structure must be clearly designated as being a car share lot, and they're not counted toward the maximum number of parking spaces. Plus, a 10% reduction in the total required parking is permitted in areas where car sharing are provided in a mixed it provided in a multifamily or a mixed use development. The 2012 amendments also addressed um, electrical automotive charging stations, allowing EV spaces to be developed and counted towards the required parking. The 2012 um, sustainability amendments created bicycle parking requirements for both short term, meaning spaces that are where park bicycles are left for short stops requiring a high degree of convenience and long-term bicycle parking for spaces that are where bicycles will be left for longer periods of time and require maybe some safety and weatherproof uh, storage considerations. So these bicycle parking standards not only established a minimum number of bicycle parking spaces that should be required, but also talked about design as well as location uh, of the spaces. We have um, sustainability regulations and guidelines in the code. Our sustainability regulations for large scale residential development uh, provide flexibility in the site design and development and allows greenways and trailway systems that provide connectivity and, and encourage pedestrian uh, uses to be counted toward the required um, open space for in, in those developments. And our sustainability guidelines uh, for all developments include um, development specification and designs and amenities, and it includes public um, infrastructure improvements such as new public transit stations and bicycle paths and the provision of car sharing facilities on site to be considered and, and reviewed as part of those amenities under the sustainability guidelines. Moving along to other recent zoning changes, uh, our zoning code in 2021, we uh, updated an exception to our off-street parking requirements in commercial districts. This section of the code takes into consideration 
many of our districts where there are there already exists significant amount of on and off street parking for the public. And some areas also takes into consideration large private parking areas uh, that serve multiple uses. The code states that um, this reduces the need for individual uses to provide their own off street parking. And it acknowledges that many of the patrons in these districts arrive by foot or by public transit. And lastly, we do have a, a, a citywide community reimburse, reinvestment area that's known as the Cleveland Heights Groden Program. It is a citywide CRA that allowing for residential properties to be eligible for property tax savings for new and remodeled uh, construction. And the terms of the incentives are based on the strength of the housing market uh, at the census track level using a variety of metrics identified by, by the city. And this is encouraging infill housing development and renovation across the city. Um, so while many of these codes and programs were not originally uh, created with the intent or the thought of transit oriented design, you can see that the effect of creating density, ensuring walk walkability and encouraging reduced park parking does result in development that falls in line with those principles that a TOD uh, design has. I'm gonna pass it back to you, Eric, for the next slide, I think. Yes, thank you, Karen. So all of that hard work over the past 20 years, I think really uh, manifested itself very clearly in the Cedar, Cedar Lee Meadowbrook project, which was approved earlier this year. And we'll talk a little bit about, about it, <clears throat> why it is a TOD project, um, some really great coordination we had with the RTA, uh, and then some real practical uh, examples of how TOD or development in the suburbs um, can be challenging and can be different than in a, a pure downtown uh, area. Just for context, uh, here's, uh, this is an excerpt from our, our master plan, but you can see Cedar Lee Meadowbrook is just south of uh, Cedar um, on, on Lee Road, and, and it's one of our longstanding uh, commercial districts. And uh, for uh, probably about 25 years now, we've had uh, two essentially uh, vacant sites. Uh, one that is green, and I put that in quotes, You'll come back to that in a second. Another that is a surface parking lot with a parking garage, totaling about 4.8 acres, but really in the heart of our uh, Cedar Lee commercial district and just across the street from the high school. So there's a lot of activity that happens here, not only uh, during special events at the high school, but even during the week. And the Cedar Lee Theater uh, is right here, if you can see my, my arrow. Uh, so as Karen had mentioned, uh, the, the mothers and fathers of, in the city had thought uh, well in advance and put together uh, a, a true mixed use and, and uh, TOD uh, district back in uh, the early 2000s. And so taking all of that, uh, when we started to look at redeveloping uh, the sites, uh, we need, there needed to be a very strong vision uh, and then goals to meet that vision. And you can see here that uh, important parts of this is to make sure that it's uh, integrated, inclusive, walkable, connecting to public spaces, and all, also that it should complement and support the businesses within the district beyond residents, residents and, and visitors. We, sat, we had some very important partners on this project, which is obviously the, uh, the developer Flaherty and Collins out of Indianapolis. And uh, the, the architect and, and development uh, advisor, City Architecture. And I'll mention them particularly because it was so important. They're not only local to Cleveland, but they're local to Cleveland Heights. And so they brought uh, with them some very uh, anecdotal but granular experience. And so when I say partners, we, we don't take this lightly. It really was and has been a partnership between the city and the developer and the design professional. So here's the project. It's, um, it's, it's off of Lee Road. It's in that, uh, that parking lot in that uh, green space. Really two separate buildings, what we call the Cedar Lee site, the Meadowbrook site. Uh, it's a total of 206 units, um, mostly one bedrooms, but some studios and two bedrooms. Has about 7,400 square feet of ground floor uh, retail space and some very significant open spaces, upgrades, as well as uh, really creation of this shared space and shared uh, shared placemaking. This is a, uh, a rendering of how it might fit or how it fits into the district. And you can see it almost creates a new spine uh, behind the buildings off of Lee Road 
uh, but one of the key components here was making sure that the design was right, but uh, only having it a stone's throw away from, from Lee Road and the transit there really made it uh, something that was gonna be walkable and marketed in that very way. Some more renderings uh, from different aspects, but you can see uh, very contextual, modern, but respectful of the past. And, um, and again, trying to really create uh, and fill in uh, those gaps in the tooth as, as we like to say. So being Cleveland Heights and being uh, a suburb, we knew that parking and traffic were gonna be uh, important issues. And so as the project began, the city uh, spoke to the development team and said, we, we really need to have a, both a parking study and a traffic study. And they agreed to uh, sort of split it 50-50, uh, but we knew we had to get out in front of it and get the real data there to show why redeveloping a parking lot was not gonna be actually all that impactful in terms of parking uh, and that the traffic was not going to be uh, a, a, the destruction of the Cedarly district. And so here's just an excerpt from the parking study. The map on the bottom is really key because it shows that there actually is a lot of off street parking and some on street parking too in the general district. So while people wouldn't be able to necessarily park on a surface parking lot in a particular area, there were so many other options. And in fact, the, uh, the use of those off street parking uh, spots were, were generally uh, underutilized. Uh, so the parking study went through a lot of different um, uh, analyses and came up with a whole bunch of mitigation options as we call them, including valet parking and uh, creating some other parking opportunities, but also modifying existing on-street parking regulations so that it sort of made, made sense. Uh, and so you can see here, there's a whole list of proposed uh, actions um, and uh, case studies that we could look to. Uh, on the traffic side, uh, some of it was related to sort of moving vehicles, but a lot of it was related to the transit aspect. And you can see here that uh, looking at where the buses were and particularly the bus pullouts, uh, that was gonna be a, an important aspect. So we had a, a number of conversations with uh, RTA, Mary Beth and her team. Um, and this rendering shows something important. This, if you see where this guy on the bicycle is, that's a, uh, a very long cutout for, for a bus. So the, the immediate reaction of the development team and the planners was, hey, do we even need that? I mean, there's a bus stop uh, sort of at the northern part of this parcel, but what's this cutout for? Can we, can we take that back? And in, in having the conversations, we, we realized that that's a, a location based upon the schedules of, of the, the bus routes where the bus has to wait. It can't get to the Cedar intersection until a certain time. And so uh, a bus driver probably more often than not might, might get there earlier, at, but they can't actually go to that intersection. So it was important to keep it here, but we worked with RTA on trying to figure out, could we shorten it? You know, could we gain some of that area back? And are there ways that we can, you know, make it useful to the project? So I think that coordination is so, so important. Penley especially when we're trying to create uh, places that are, are walkable and, uh, and meaningful. Just wanna talk a little bit about the engagement uh, because I think that's such an important part of any development, but particularly transit oriented development since it's gonna be more dense. We were very intentional and we totally got our hand out there uh, on the number of meetings we were gonna have. We said we were gonna have nine meetings and you see it ended up being 10, but nine meetings in the public realm. This doesn't mean that there weren't other meetings that happened, but the, these were the, the times where people could come and learn about the project and also comment on the project and comment about very specific things. And of course we chose parking and traffic to be the, the, the kickoff meeting. And it was, a, it was somewhat of a contentious meeting, uh, but by the time we got to uh, later on, the, the, the second workshop in parking and traffic, most people had been converted to believing that this was actually a good thing. And here's just some pictures from, from those events. Um, and then uh, some of the other efforts that we made, we had a project website. Uh, I, I actually went out and did meet and greets in, in the community, in the neighborhood in particular. Uh, and although the picture there, which is from 
the uh, cleveland.com shows uh, shows some grass on the ground. It actually was a November meet and greet I was supposed to do out there with a lot of snow. So uh, it, it does snow in November, as we know from this year. But it was it went a long way to get people uh, to come and talk about the project and understand it and understand transit-oriented development. Uh, I initially had this slide up front, but it's a quote from the comedian uh, Stephen Wright, uh, who of course is very sar sardonic, and uh, you know just saying that he would just just for giggles would go downtown and park and and wait for people to ask him uh, when he's leaving because that's really the mentality that so many people have, and. As you can imagine, the, the businesses in the Cedar Lee District were potentially our number one NIMBY, not, not in my backyard. These were the folks that were gonna be immediately impacted by the project. It was gonna take up surface parking. It was gonna bring a lot of activity. And that was, in their minds, potentially gonna impact their businesses. But we met a number of times with them and really explained you know, the, the entire project, why it's good for them, and uh, addressed some very specific things about construction and, and phasing, and also just the ability for uh, maybe, for example, for the, uh, the theater, uh, many seniors and, and the handicapped folks um, go to the Cedar Lee Theater. So making sure that there were handicapped access, accessible spaces closer to the theater, uh, was a, just an important point and something that the city and the development team were were happy to do. There was a separate effort uh, by residents of the uh, city to preserve the uh, the green space on the Meadowbrook site, um, and they weren't necessarily uh, had ne didn't necessarily have pure intentions. Uh, it, it was probably more about no development, but they utilized the the green space as as something as a talking point, and they got something on on a ballot uh, to be voted on. So it was uh, issue number nine and uh, the efforts called build CLM or vote no on nine were all the businesses. These were the people who focused their attention, their activity and their time to really getting the information out because the city couldn't uh, really oppose a, a resident initiated ballot. So the folks that were, um, potentially NIMBYs in one point became NIMBYs. They became the yes in my backyard folks. These were the ones who were leading the effort and they came to meetings saying, we can't wait until this project is up because we know this is gonna be so vital to our business. And you can see on the right, there's a article that Steve uh, Litt wrote uh, generally about uh, NIMBYism, but specifically about this project and how it was so important really for Northeast Ohio. Uh, so I wanna move off of Cleveland Heights and talk a little bit about my experiences from New York and, and two different types of experiences, but ones that I think can help inform everyone uh, on the call today. And um, they're very different, but I think they also reflect my uh, sort of upbringing in, as a transit planner, transportation planner more specifically. So I'll start out with the Port Chester form based code and then talk about the Route 110 BRT. So just by way of Port Chester, this is where I had worked previously to coming here. It's a, a, a community, a village, uh, about 20 miles north uh, of New York City. It's uh, on the Long Island Sound, but the last town on I-95 before you get to Connecticut. And uh, it has a train station, about 45 minutes to Grand Central Station. And it's, uh, it's always been a uh, sort of the stepchild of some of the richest communities and zip codes in the country, the town of Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, Rye, New York, Paris, and these are places that you may have heard of. They're, they're very, very wealthy. And so it's always been a working class community and forgotten. Well, in the uh, 2010s, people started to realize that costs in New York were way too expensive, both to live and also to develop. So they started looking into the suburbs and uh, they started to look at places like Port Chester. So we, we got a lot of development pressures, but the designs were poor because our codes were poor. And uh, we had a tough approval process. So it made everything just hard and it wasn't satisfactory to, to anybody. And we were also losing out to some other communities who were thinking ahead, including the city of, of New Rochelle, which is further down uh, on the Long Island Sound. 
So the village looked at itself and said, our focus should be on transit oriented development. We have a train station and we have a tight knit fabric around that train station. And that's where the development should be. And we should try to protect or preserve the, the residential nature of the rest of the village. And we were successful in convincing um, the board of trustees there and the village manager to go to a form-based approach, which uh, for those of you on the call who don't realize it, it, it doesn't mean that use and density and those things isn't part of the discussion. It's just that the form, the look is the bigger circle on the page. And we, we use this as the example where you could have a townhouse development in a place where it doesn't make any sense, uh, where everybody's gonna have to hop in their car and they're gonna have to drive somewhere, or you could have a townhouse in the right place. And that led us to having this um, guiding principle, which is create a code that allows for the right type of a development in the right type of places. And I think that's something we can use here in, in Cuyahoga County is where are the places where TOD makes sense, where different types of TOD make sense, and where are the places where it doesn't make any sense. So there were a lot of background analyses that were done as part of this. We wanted to make sure that the data was there. And we held a lot of public meetings. Uh, I think it ended up being 52 over a two year period uh, with all different parts of the community. You can see here different uh, lists of who we met with. And the result was uh, the form-based code, uh, which not only meant to be, be form-based, but also was gonna look very different. And you can see here, very visual, hopefully easy to use, pictures to try to tell people what to expect in terms of type, different types of building types and uses, but not forgetting that uses were important and here's what the use table looked like. And the result was going from, I think it was 27 zoning districts that made no sense to 11. And on the right, you can see that the darker shade is where the most density was. And not surprisingly, it was around the train station. The lighter stuff, the blue in particular, were the single and two family districts. And that was essentially gonna stay the same. We conducted a build out analysis to show what it might look like uh, should the zoning code go through and every property were to be redeveloped. And this was important in terms of being transparent and letting people know, even if they disagreed with it, but at least they could start to visualize it and picture it. An important part of the code and something I wanted to mention to everyone is um, how we treated parking. Because actually prior to this code, the planners before my time uh, had in the downtown district um, taken out the requirement for parking. That led to a lot of problems. Not, not just because residents and maybe even elected officials and planning commissioners were uncomfortable with it, but every development project that was coming in was, was asking for some parking. So everybody asked the question, rightfully so, why are we not requesting parking, but yet even the developers are, are asking for it? So in the form-based code, we sort of went against the common practice and we put zoning re regulations, parking requirements back in. And we tried to right-size them and make sure they really made sense. But then we were a bit creative in trying to um, have a way to de decrease that parking from, from a large number to potentially zero. Uh, and you can see here, this is just an excerpt from the code. This is how you calculate the, the parking spaces. We were very much into the idea of shared parking. And this is a, an image that we, we've, uh, I think, stole from somewhere else. But then we said, working particularly with uh, Metro North and um, Westchester County, which ran the Beeline system, if you had a development that was closer to a public transit station or stop, you could get a discount. 75% if you were within 500 feet of the railroad station, 50% if you were within a quarter mile of the station, and 20% within 500 feet of a Beeline bus station or bus stop. If you were providing bicycle parking, you could get a, a decrease in this way. If you had car sharing, you could get a decrease to a maximum of 12 spaces. And then there were financial incentives. And this is something that the county actually really was pushing that if the development, if the residential development separated out the, the, the parking from the rents and gave 
the tenant the option, you could get a credit for that if you were using financial stuff credit. And if they were providing um, railroad tickets, uh, that would also be an incentive to, to get the number down. And finally, something that was necessary at the time and probably the most controversial was putting in a payment in lieu of parking. The village of Porchester didn't want to get into the business of building a parking garage, but we understood at the time that we probably had to, at least in some ways, explore that option. And that's, that's what this uh, led to. Uh, so with all those things together, a developer could get to zero, but almost all of them didn't want to. They wanted to provide a certain amount of parking, but it gave at least an option and a sort of a logical option to get there. There were other elements that uh, just wanted to mention for the group here is that uh, there's a significant affordable housing requirement or set aside in the code. Um, no bonuses, that was one of the sort of principal things that we had is be very clear what the zoning should be <clears throat> and, uh, and what you can attain in terms of height and density. Don't say, well, if you do this, you get that because that just makes it unclear to everyone. It retained the special districts that had already existed and left the, uh, the one and two family districts intact. We also did some streamlined financial incentives at the same time and worked very closely with the school district, which we thought was important because they were worried about overcrowding and how all this new uh, residential would uh, overwhelm their, their schools. But in fact, apartments tend not to generate many kids at all. In fact, one single family generates a lot more. And once we showed them that and did a study on that, they were very much on board and supporters. So that's another example of making a NIMBY into a YIMBY. And so the results are, you know, some things that are quite impressive, uh, not necessarily relevant to uh, most of us here, but you can see these are two recent proposals. Um, and this was actually after a long, painful period after I left and there was other change in leadership, including the mayor not running again and the village manager leaving so that the, uh, the vision wasn't able to be solidified. Uh, and so recently, like in the last uh, month, they were able to finally approve some of the first projects. Uh, but they've also looked back at those parking innovations against sort of the, 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 the planner's better will to, uh, to pull some of those back. Because again, it's the suburbs and people are uncomfortable with allowing minimal, minimal parking. So it's just something that I think we have to realize as we move forward. Just very quickly to want to run through the second um, project here. This is the Route 110 corridor and BRT project on Long Island. You can see on this map, this is the eastern portion of Long Island. Um, and it's it's the actually Suffolk County, which is the second county out from New York City. Um, and north to south, on these corridors and the Route 110 corridor is approximately the same distance as the Isle of Manhattan. Uh, so there was a, a long planning effort in trying to figure out how to take what's pretty much a strip commercial and industrial corridor and make it a better place. And so back in 2011, uh, the town of Babylon hired Jeff Speck to uh, do a, a TOD plan and just a, a product uh, placement. I do have his two books up here on my shelf. It's both Suburban Nation, uh, one of his first ones, and then uh, Walkable City. And I happened to be a consultant at the time and, and worked on the team with, with, with Jeff, but it was very much, here was a, 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 a underutilized uh, municipal airport um, and uh, a place that there used to be a train station and there no longer was. So could there be a new train station and a new development around that. And that's sort of being the center of a new transit corridor that would link the North and South shores of Long Island. With that as the momentum, the city, uh, the, the town of Babylon uh, procured a uh, sort of the first step in the FTA process of doing alternatives analysis. And uh, so we, uh, I was working at the town of Babylon at the time. And uh, the result was, uh, that um, BRT was the selected alternative. It made the most sense. Uh, Cleveland was the example that we really pointed to and that there were gonna be stations up and down this corridor that spanned three different towns and municipalities. So the challenge there is how do you try to unite a project or a transit system 
with transit-oriented development amongst three different uh, municipalities. And so I worked really hard on trying to put together a, an overlay district, called it the TOD overlay district. Uh, and it was going to um, not be form-based, it was gonna be more traditionally Euclidean, but an overlay district with a core area, which was a quarter mile around the station area, and then a transition area that went out to a half a mile. It did talk about uses, some density and bolt regulations, but also looked at design, parking, and sustainability. And that was gonna be something that was going to be available uh, and hopefully adopted by each of the towns along the corridor so that the development could be unified or at least the approach could be unified. Part and parcel to the zoning was gonna be a set of design guidelines. And very similarly, uh, it was going to uh, talk about things that uh, would make, make a, a big impact, site design, facade design and treatment, building materials, colors, and signage. We looked very heavily at other examples. And in fact, uh, the York region in Ontario had done something very similar. Uh, and uh, we also pointed to what good design around tr transit was uh, throughout the, the New York metro region. Unfortunately, again, sort of I left and, and moved on to Port Chester, uh, but there was also a need to focus on operations and engineering to get into the small starts or new starts program for FTA. And uh, so uh, the, the, the planning and zoning part of that was put in the background and uh, the, the, uh, the county took over the lead of the project and, and has been uh, moving that along through the FTA process. They had a, a meeting recently, well, it was last year. Um, and the different communities have been working independently of each other, but it looks like there's going to be more of a focus. So I think this is a model of a way to look at it as we talk about our corridors, uh, because again, our transit uh, lines or bus lines really go amongst uh, Three, three would be a small number of communities that, that it goes through. So just to, to wrap up for everyone, uh, I think our takeaways from this is that every community that has transit service has a TOD opportunity of some sort, but we really have to be proactive in identifying uh, those opportunities, make sure that we've got the zoning right and the design is right, get the parking right, because we know that's an issue in, in the suburbs and making sure that our investments and incentives align, whether that's infrastructure or our tax incentives. Regional cooperation is necessary and it's it's great that RTA is sort of leading this effort because again, they're the, the T in the transit for the most part. There are so many opportunities to make those NIMBYs into NIMBYs, NIMBYs and they will do the work for us. Uh, they, they will do that hard work to fight, fight the good fight. And we just have to be transparent and upfront. Let's be very clear about what, what we're trying to do. And I think once we do that, uh, people uh, can respect, they can disagree, but re respect what uh, the effort is about. And uh, so with that, I just wanted to leave this one image here because I think it's, it was telling that uh, sometimes we, we have to sort of sacrifice or take a piece of ourselves to, to, to lead towards the future. And I think that's what really what we're doing here is, you know, of course, having a lot of parking is easier to do, but if we sacrifice that and if we think about, you know, what's really, better for the future, then it's going to make it better for all of us, our children, our grandchildren, and everyone else. So uh, that's that's really our presentation. And uh, there's our contact information if you had any specific questions. But uh, Karen and, and I are here to talk for the next uh, 10 or so minutes if you have any specific questions. Thank you, Eric. 